Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm going to be talking about two things. First, the idea that evolution deniers seem to hold about how revered Darwin is, and second, context. So let's go! The idea for this video was sparked by an interaction that I had with my personal troll. This person, as of this writing, follows only myself and Professor Stick, so clearly he has excellent taste. Now I can't speak to how Professor Stick finds his interactions with him. Actually, come to think of it, I haven't even seen Professor Stick interact with him, so maybe the good professor has better judgment than I do. But in my case, he seems to just want to disagree with everything I say no matter what. It can be fun at times, but he's easy enough to ignore when it stops being fun. On to what he actually said. In true troll fashion, he hijacked a conversation that was actually about whether or not we should respect the beliefs and practices of other cultures that we in our culture find immoral. So he brought up this quote from Darwin in response to being called a racist and then claimed that this necessarily refutes evolution. What he claimed that Darwin said is, if my mind is nothing more than an evolved monkey and I wouldn't trust a monkey to make choices for me, then my mind is untrustworthy. Now, this quote is taken completely out of context, but let's ignore that for the moment. Context is the second part of this video, and we'll also ignore the fact that he completely butchered it. Let's pretend that Darwin, in his old age, decided that he could no longer accept his own theory of evolution by means of natural selection. This is absolutely not the case, but for argument's sake, we'll say that it is. Creationists love to jump all over quotes that, when read out of context, suggest that Darwin doubted his theory. They love to publish books and blogs along these lines, such as Darwin's Doubt by Stephen Meyer, or Darwin's Horrid Doubt, The Mind, on the Evolution News blog. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt, see what I did there, and uh, agree that Darwin had severe doubts about his theory. What would that mean for modern evolutionary biology? In a word, nothing. I know this is hard for creationists to understand, but in science we try our best to not hold people in undue esteem or reverence. Darwin started the process that led to modern evolutionary biology, and any doubt that he ever expressed has been adequately addressed, even if it was after his time. Darwin is not some inerrant prophet that we need to believe always spoke the truth and never got anything wrong. In fact, Darwin was entirely wrong when describing the mechanism for which he believed traits were passed down from parent to offspring. His hypothesis was pangenesis, the idea that every cell in the body sheds small organic particles called gemmules that are essentially little representations of itself. These gemmules would end up in the gonads, resulting in the passing on of heritable traits. This hypothesis allowed for Lamarckian evolution, where acquired characteristics can be passed down to future generations, and this whole concept is entirely indefensibly wrong. Creationists would have you believe that we don't teach the areas that Darwin was wrong or had doubts about in school because we want to preserve this almost godlike image of Darwin as the father of evolution with a capital E. But the real reason is much simpler. If Darwin was wrong about something, there's no point teaching it because it's wrong. Should a teacher waste an entire lesson going over Darwin's hypothesis of pangenesis? What about his other concerns? If Darwin had doubts about something that he ended up being right about, then there's no point in teaching his doubt, just teach the bit that ended up being right. If he was wrong about something, don't teach that either, for the simple reason that it's wrong. Teachers don't have unlimited time with their students, they have to select very carefully what is taught and only stick to relevant topics. The book Darwin's Doubt deals with Darwin's concern about the lack of Precambrian fossils. Darwin really was concerned about the lack of Precambrian fossils, but we found them. The trouble with finding them in Darwin's day is that most of them are microscopic. So why would a teacher waste time in class explaining in detail to students the fact that Darwin had an issue with the apparent lack of Precambrian fossils? It deserves a passing reference at most. Something like, Darwin was concerned about the lack of Precambrian fossils, but we have since discovered thousands of them in an introduction to the subject. And this all comes back to the creationist idea that evolution is a religion, and that Charles Darwin is the evolutionist's one true prophet. Evolution is not a religion. It suffers revision when it is wrong about something. Pangenesis was replaced by Mendelian inheritance. In fact, Mendelian inheritance was offhandedly dismissed by biologists for years because it didn't seem to fit in with the accepted ideas about inheritance of the time. Mendel published originally in 1866, but his findings were mostly ignored until 1900. 
The very basis for how genetics work was a fringe idea that was not accepted by the scientific community for decades. But when the evidence piled up, the scientific community had no choice but to accept that their ideas about inheritance were wrong and that Mendel's were right. Darwin himself, inerrant prophet of evolution, was wrong. <gasps> And it didn't matter one bit, because it never has mattered. Science has no profits. In fact, one of the main requirements for an idea to be considered scientific is the ability to prove it wrong, or falsifiability. If it is impossible to disprove an idea, then that idea is of no scientific value. Darwin's idea of evolution by natural selection has withstood the test of time and scrutiny. Darwin's idea of heritable traits by pangenesis did not withstand the test of time and scrutiny. Guess which one we teach in schools? Oh, and did I mention that had Darwin not come up with his theory of evolution by natural selection, then we'd be talking about Wallacean evolution instead of Darwinian? Because Alfred Russell Wallace developed pretty much the same theory as Darwin at the same time, completely independently. In fact, the first time evolution by natural selection was ever officially presented, it was a joint effort by both Darwin and Wallace in 1858, the year before On the Origin of Species was published. So as it turns out, while Darwin was a brilliant man who helped greatly with the advancement of science, had he never been born, we would still have the same theory of evolution that we have today. So there you have it. If you prove to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that Darwin became a young Earth creationist in his old age, or even demonstrated that he had serious concerns about his theory while he was developing it, that would not affect the theory of evolution in any way, shape, or form. One person's opinion, even if that person is Charles Darwin himself, does not disprove a scientific theory. But this brings me to my next point, context. First, he completely butchered the quote. To reiterate, what he put in quotation marks suggesting that Darwin actually wrote it word for word was, If my mind is nothing more than an involved monkey and I wouldn't trust a monkey to make my choices for me, then my mind is untrustworthy. The actual quote that he was looking for is, But then with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind which has been developed from the mind of lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? On its own, this does seem to be at least a little bit damning. But let's look at the context, shall we? This quote is taken from a letter to William Graham with regards to Graham's book, The Creed of Science. Now here I will freely admit that I have not read the whole Creed of Science book. I have skimmed through some of it, so I can't speak to the full context of Darwin's letter to Graham, but what is clear is that Graham saw evolution as a threat to religion. So in Darwin's letter, he is speaking to a critic of the theory of evolution. Now let's look at more of the letter. You would not probably expect anyone to fully agree with you on so many abstruse subjects, and there are some points in your book which I cannot digest. The chief one is that the existence of so-called natural laws implies purpose. I cannot see this. Not to mention that many expect that the several great laws will someday be found to follow inevitably from some one single law, yet taking the laws as we now know them and look at the moon, where the law of gravitation, and no doubt of the conservation of energy, of the atomic theory, etc., etc., hold good, and I cannot see that there is then necessarily any purpose. Would there be purpose if the lowest organisms alone destitute of consciousness existed in the moon? But I have had no practice in abstract reasoning, and I may be all astray. Nevertheless, you have expressed my inward conviction, though far more vividly and clearly than I could have done, that the universe is not the result of chance. But then with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind which has been developed from the minds of lower animals are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? So looking at the context here, knowing that he was talking to a critic of the theory of evolution, we can see that he didn't mean that we can't trust our brains at all with any reasoning because they are monkey brains, as my troll suggested, but rather he was pointing out one of the key problems that we use the scientific process to overcome, the fact that the world works in ways that our brains did not evolve to understand. In this specific case, the fact that we see meaning and purpose where there is none. The scientific process is designed specifically to overcome these shortcomings of our monkey brains. The idea is that any one person might be wrong about something, so this person presents his ideas to other people that study the same thing to see what they think. If that person is right, then his idea is adopted until a better idea can either complete, complement, or replace his idea. Yes, sometimes science has held on to erroneous ideas and rejected more accurate ideas, such as in the case of Mendelian inheritance. 
But as more scientists publish their results, inconsistencies will be found with any incomplete or erroneous ideas, and they will eventually be replaced by more accurate ones. This is often a slow and tedious process, with the lone genius scientist making a discovery all on his own and shouting Eureka being the exception rather than the rule. But it works. Yes, likely a lot of scientific ideas that we hold and teach today will be found to be wrong in one way or another in the future. But that is how science progresses, by finding out which of our ideas are wrong and correcting them. But then I was told that the Bible is consistently taken out of context as a way of disproving it, specifically with regard to the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. So let's look at some of these prophecies. Let's start with the most obvious, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Now when Christians point to this as an Old Testament prophecy for Jesus, they will often just quote verse 5 or verse 7. Verse 5 being, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And verse 7 being, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears are silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now for the moment we can ignore the part in verse 5 where it says he was crushed for our iniquities, which never happened to Jesus, but let's look at some of the other context that makes it clear this is not about Jesus, or rather that the character of Jesus was not written well enough to have fulfilled this prophecy. Verse 3 and 4 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. This doesn't fit with the story of Jesus at all, where his followers and admirers numbered in the thousands and who was smitten by Romans, not by God. He was forsaken by God in the end, sure, but he was not smitten by God. There's also a part in verse 9 that says he had done no violence, which doesn't fit very well with him chasing the money changers out of the temple at the end of a whip. Then again, in verse 10, it says that it is the will of the Lord to crush him, which directly contradicts John 19.36, where he says that not one of his bones will be broken. And at the end of verse 10, it says that he shall see his offspring. I don't recall Jesus having any kids. I mean, I suppose it's possible the Bible doesn't explicitly state that he didn't have kids, at least not that I'm aware of, but that kind of flies in the face of the traditional picture of Jesus. So if you look at this prophecy in its entirety, with full context, it does not fit the story of Jesus very well at all, so it must be taken out of context in order to make it fit. Now let's look at another prophecy about Jesus, and this time look at how the books of the Bible take the other books of the Bible out of context. In Matthew 2 verses 5 and 6, the Magi are visiting King Herod, and they quote scripture to say where Jesus will be born. They quote Micah 5 2 and say, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. But firstly, they got the quote wrong. With the actual quote reading, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And secondly, they took it completely out of context. The fact that they dropped the word Ephrathah is a hint at this, as in Micah they are talking about a clan of Hebrews who weren't a big enough clan to actually be called one of the clans of Judah. And if you read on to verses 5 and 6, it makes it clear that the leader that Micah is talking about is supposed to deliver Israel from the Assyrians. Since the Romans were most definitely in charge when Jesus was supposed to have been born, not the Assyrians, this prophecy couldn't possibly be about him. So the author of Matthew took this prophecy out of context to make it fit. Tellingly, this is not a prophecy that I have ever heard a Christian quote as proof that Jesus was fulfilling prophecies. It's only quoted that way by the author of Matthew, who was writing in a time when not only would it have been hard for people to check his sources, but he also might not even have had access to the original source himself and legitimately was just mistaken about what the passage actually said. And just for the record, I verified the context of that passage with an expert in the cultures of ancient Mesopotamia, Dr. Josh of Digital Hammurabi, or officially, the Honorable Right Reverend Dr. Master Joshua Aaron Bowen of the Greater Ebenezer New Revival Tree of Life Institutional Double Rock on the Side of the Road to Jericho Missionary Baptist Church of Zion. Thanks a bunch, and if any of you are interested in ancient Near Eastern culture or language, definitely go to check out Digital Hammurabi. They're pretty fantastic. So these are just two instances where the proper context surrounding biblical prophecies makes it clear that the later out-of-context interpretations by the Christians are incorrect, which of course then calls into question the idea of biblical inerrancy. And as an ironic side note, the misinterpretation of the prophecy in Micah is one of the most compelling arguments that I am aware of for the existence of an historical Jesus. The idea is that the authors of Matthew and Luke were aware of this prophecy and had interpreted it to mean that the Messiah would be born in the city of Bethlehem, 
but the man who the Jesus character of the Bible was based on was well known to have come from Nazareth, so the contradictory birth stories from Matthew and Luke were both contrived to make the prophecy fit with the known facts about the person. And of course they make him come from Nazareth in different ways, with Luke having Joseph travel to Bethlehem from Nazareth for the census, and Matthew having them already living in Bethlehem and fleeing to Egypt to avoid Herod's killing of babies, followed by them moving to Nazareth when Herod dies. The counter to this from the mythicist camp is that Nazareth doesn't seem to have even existed until a few hundred years after the time of Jesus, and the idea that he came from a city called Nazareth was based on a mistranslation or misunderstanding of the term Nazarite, which was not a person from Nazareth, but an Israelite that was consecrated to the service of God, and as such would avoid alcohol, haircuts, and touching dead bodies. And no matter who is right, the mythicist camp or the historical Jesus camp, both arguments rely on the Bible having obvious and demonstrable problems all surrounding context. What I'm getting at here is that context is important, no matter which side of an argument you are on. I have never purposely taken the Bible out of context. I try my best to make sure that I have the correct context when discussing passages like these and with the scientific sources that I use. If I am wrong, let me know and cite your sources. Being factually correct is more important to me than winning an argument. It seems to me that context is mostly a problem for creationists. They will quote one line out of an entire paper that supports evolution, but that one line listed a problem that they encountered. They'll completely ignore the following paragraph where they explain how that apparent problem isn't actually a problem. And the same goes for the Bible. Short verses taken out of their original context are applied to completely unrelated situations and are proclaimed to have been prophetic. If the Bible really is the word of God, I want to know about it. But when you ignore huge chunks of it in order to piece together a little prophecy about Jesus, it makes it look like it's just a bunch of often unrelated books put together over centuries and forced to fit a narrative that they were never intended to fit. Which, coincidentally, is exactly what you would expect to see in a book like the Bible if its authorship was not divinely guided. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Thank you again to Digital Hammurabi for helping me out with some context. Remember to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and see you next time.